So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano, and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, The eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. 
For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It'd been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption, with a deafening roar a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. Phew, you can finally send that last report for the day and breathe out. The weekend is around the corner. But just when you're about to hit send, you're alarmed by the low rumbling under your desk. Is it the light rail passing by? Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's a volcano speaking. What, here? In Arizona? 
That's right, the ground keeps shifting under Arizona, reminding us that Earth is alive. No panic though, let's arm ourselves with some context. 20 American states have extinct, active, and dormant, currently sleeping, volcanoes. Among such states, you can find California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. On the bright side, Arizona's volcanoes are dormant at the moment, but it doesn't mean they won't go off in the near or not so near future. Now, how about traveling to Arizona to check the traces of its active volcanic past? They dot the desert landscapes of this state like spots dot a Dalmatian. There are entire volcanic fields southwest of Phoenix, east of Douglas, near Flagstaff, north of Kingman, and near the Mexico border. The most worrying thing about these fields is that even though they're not active at the moment, eruptions in this region might happen every thousand years or so. Well, the time seems to be up. The last powerful and destructive volcanic eruption occurred around 1,000 years ago at the Sunset Crater. Oh, this place is worth paying more attention to. And we will, but a bit later. First, we have to talk about hotspots. No, not that place where you can surf the web. In our volcanic context, a hotspot is a place where insane amounts of heat melt the overlying crust, Earth's thin outer layer, and form volcanoes. This heat rises from the mantle, which is located between our planet's dense, superheated core and the crust. Want to see an example of this type of volcanism? Welcome to the Hawaiian Islands. The Big Island has its active volcanoes because, at the moment, it's situated on top of the Hawaiian hotspot. The older Hawaiian Islands were once there too, but later they drifted off towards the northwest. It happened because that's where the oceanic crust on top of which they sat, namely the Pacific Plate, moved. Now, look at the world's ocean basins. Yes, they're literally dotted with islands that sit on top of hotspots, like Hawaii. Iceland, Samoa, the Galapagos, those are probably the most famous examples. But don't think that continents can't host hotspots, they can, but those are far less common. One of the most famous continental hotspots is, ah, I bet you know it, yep, the one beneath the Yellowstone caldera. By the way, the caldera is a vast volcanic crater especially one formed as a result of a massive eruption that led to the collapse of the mouth of a volcano. The Yellowstone hotspot is basically the creator of Old Faithful and the rest of the hot springs and mud pots for which the national park is famous. Speaking of Old Faithful, let's make a small detour and pay more attention to this wonder of nature. It's one of the most well-known geysers in the world. People have been coming from all over the globe to see it for more than a century. The cool thing about this geyser is that the likes of it can only form under very specific conditions. That's why they're pretty rare. Magma under the surface superheats pockets of underground water. The pressure there keeps growing until it eventually pushes the water upward with immense strength. A certain volcanic rock with a high silica content lines the tunnel through which this water escapes. Basically, it creates a unique pipe that can withstand unbelievable pressure and heat created by the water erupting above the ground. Old Faithful was the very first named geyser in Yellowstone. If you come to visit it expecting the thing to erupt every hour on the hour, you're gonna be disappointed. On average, Old Faithful erupts every 91 minutes or so, which isn't that bad either. Plus, you can download a special app which will provide you with the approximate time of the next eruption. But be very careful while visiting and stay away from the site. The water erupting from the powerful geyser reaches 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is even more scorching, up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to bake a cake. But let's get back to our volcanic hotspots. Scientists still don't clearly understand why there aren't many hotspot volcanoes on continental crust. One reason might be that the continental crust is much thicker than the oceanic crust, 
which is about four times as thick on average. Another reason could be that most of Earth's crust, about two-thirds of it, is oceanic. This means that there's less continental crust for hotspots to form under. Now, I bet those of you living in Arizona will appreciate the following info. We'll talk about a volcanic field right in the heart of this state, the San Francisco Volcanic Field. That's a massive area filled with over 600 volcanoes. Yes, they're mostly small, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. They're scattered across 1,800 square miles in northern Arizona, a giant territory. Interestingly, scientists are still debating about whether this volcanic field is actually sitting on top of a hotspot. But one thing they agree upon, the volcanoes in this area get younger as you move east. And this pattern matches up with the North American plate moving west over what could be a stationary hotspot beneath the surface of our planet. Cool, huh? The volcanic hullabaloo in that area started around 6 million years ago. So, in geological terms, it's relatively young. As for the most recent eruption, it happened less than a thousand years ago. The Sunset Crater, which I mentioned before, the one near Flagstaff, is the most famous vent from that eruption. The Sinagua people had to leave their homes at Wupatki Pueblo because of the eruption. That site is now part of the Wupatki National Monument. There, you can see how people lived in this volcanic region many years ago. If you go to explore this area, you'll notice that most of the volcanoes there are basalt cinder cones, small and steep. The Colorado Plateau has quite dry weather conditions. That's why the volcanoes haven't worn down much. Some of the best examples of those cones, like this one, called the SP Crater, still look like they appeared yesterday. But look around. It's not just cinder cones. The San Francisco volcanic field also has a stratovolcano, as well as some lava domes that formed from volcanic rocks with more silica than basalt you can find in places like Hawaii. It means they're thicker and don't flow as easily. Anyway, the stratovolcano is going to be one of the most epic sights you'll come across while exploring this volcanic field. Well, not the stratovolcano itself, but the San Francisco peaks, the remains of that giant formation. They stand tall at more than 12,600 feet. That's four and a half Burj Khalifas placed on top of one another. It makes the peaks some of the biggest landmarks in northern Arizona. They're not only stunning, but also sacred to the Native American people who have lived in the area for many generations. Now, unlike those super active volcanoes in Hawaii, the San Francisco volcanic field takes its time thousands of years between eruptions. But you shouldn't relax just yet. Geologists say another eruption is likely to happen one day. It will probably occur in the remote eastern part of the field, away from big towns. Phew! And if that next eruption is anything like the one that formed Sunset Crater, it would be quite the show. Lava fountains and rivers of lava flowing. At the same time, the next eruption might not happen for centuries, maybe even millennia. Until then, the San Francisco volcanic field will remain a hidden gem of volcanic history, waiting for its next fiery performance. One of the largest apocalypses that humanity has experienced happened about 74,000 years ago on the territory of modern Indonesia. It was an eruption of a supervolcano on Mount Toba. It was also the biggest eruption on Earth over the last two million years. Even the tragedy of Pompeii, when the volcano Vesuvius destroyed the entire city, was not so large scale. At the time of the Toba eruption, humanity was as close to extinction as ever. And the problem wasn't in the volcano itself, but in the consequences that came after. Some studies suggest that 3 to 10,000 people could survive the period after the eruption. During the disaster, Toba released millions of tons of volcanic ash and soot. This cloud spread across the sky, blocking the sun in India, Indonesia, and over the Indian Ocean. Some scientists claimed the world had been plunged into volcanic winter for several decades. 
Take a look out the window in cloudy weather. Do you see how gray clouds cover the sky? But still, clouds let the sunlight pass through. It was much worse during the Toba eruption since sulfur dioxide in the volcanic ash reflected sunlight. Dust and ashes didn't settle for a long time. Perhaps they flew all over the planet, destroying many living things. A lot of plants couldn't survive because of the lack of sunlight. Also, Earth's temperature dropped by several degrees, which led to new disasters. In today's modern world, the temperature doesn't affect residents of our cities that much. But for nature, even minor changes may entail catastrophic consequences. For example, plants and insects can live at the same temperature for thousands of years, but a sharp cold snap destroys them. This leads to the fact that almost all animals don't get enough food to feed their offspring. The population of all creatures in the wild is dropping. The ancient people of that time survived by hunting herbivores and gathering berries, fruits, and mushrooms. But the eruption destroyed almost all of them. Also, a lack of light caused a lack of vitamin D. As a result, people were starving and they also were pretty depressed. However, some scientists think that many people survived this period quite easily, especially those who lived on the coast of South Africa. The ocean received the most minor damage from the disaster. The tribes who lived near the water caught a lot of fish. Both versions haven't yet been proven. Scientists still try to build an accurate picture of human development after this volcanic apocalypse. About 50,000 years after the Toba eruption, when the sun had finally passed through the gray clouds and the ash settled on the ground, nature and people began to restore the previous balance. But the warm times quickly didn't start as the ice age had already begun. And this problem was much more severe as it lasted for thousands of years. Decreased solar activity and planet orbit changes led to strong temperature drops. Eternal cold covered almost the entire globe, forcing all living beings to migrate and struggle for survival. Such powerful animals as mammoths and saber-toothed tigers couldn't survive the Ice Age. But Homo sapiens were able to adapt to their new weather conditions. People hid in caves, made fires, and improved their hunting skills. Therefore, in a sense, the Ice Age made humanity stronger. In the modern world, such weather can cause significant problems for the global economy and create financial crises worldwide. The last period similar to the Ice Age happened at the beginning of the 19th century. Mount Tambora in Indonesia exploded and released millions of tons of pumice, soot, and volcanic ash into the sky. People who lived on a volcanic island got the most severe damage in the first few minutes, but then the eruption's consequences began to reach the whole world. Volcanic ash again blocked sunlight and led to one of the coldest years in North America and Eurasia. This year, 1816, is better known in history as the year without summer. The ash cloud increased humidity and lowered the temperature in many areas. In the summer of 1816 in Central and Western Europe and North America, a humid climate and cold destroyed the harvest. Prices for goods rose and poor people lost access to food. Logistics and transport also suffered. People used horses to move around at that time. And since oats became expensive, many couldn't afford to keep these animals. Many believe these circumstances inspired the inventor Carl Drace to create the world's first bicycle. Also, there's a theory that the Tambora eruption helped invent Frankenstein. Several writers, including Byron and Shelley, gathered in a villa in Switzerland where they began to write fantastic novels. Bad weather and rain outside the window inspired Mary Shelley to write a story about Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. Even now, this volcano is active, but it's not going to wake up anymore. But if it happens again, will we be ready this time? Most likely, there will be fewer consequences since we have technologies, big incubators, and greenhouses where we grow livestock, vegetables, and fruits. Of course, winter will provoke a crisis all year round, but we can easily survive it.
In the 1930s, another disaster occurred. But this time, it was caused not only by nature, but also by people. At that time, many countries were heavily dependent on crops. Vast territories were sown with them. People were engaged in excessive farming. Therefore, when a severe drought began, the soil was quickly depleted. The ground ran out of nutrients necessary for the growth of wheat and corn. This led to the fact that the top layer of soil was turned into tiny dust. Then, west easterly winds hit such states as Colorado, Nebraska, Texas, and Oklahoma. They rose the dust into the air and formed thick clouds. This period is considered the most challenging time of the Great Depression. It's the Dust Bowl. It lasted eight years and forced many people to leave their homes and move to other states. Dust storms got so strong that they blocked the sun in Washington, D.C. Whole cities were covered with rain from sand, which caused problems with breathing. Even the captains of ships sailing in the Atlantic Ocean reported polluted air. Powerful earthquakes, supervolcano eruptions, floods, fires, and hurricanes swept whole species of animals off the planet. But a human has always survived in the most challenging conditions. So don't worry about the next global catastrophe. People will handle it. We hope so. But what if some global catastrophe happens? For example, a huge meteorite falls or the atmosphere gets poisoned. In this case, it'd be best to find a remote island or fly to the moon. The main thing is to have the opportunity to return. After all, sooner or later, the apocalypse ends and Earth will be as good as new, probably. Another option is to live in an underground bunker with large reserves of food and oxygen. About 8 billion people are living in the world for humanity to prosper again after the apocalypse and restore its population, one to 500 people will be enough. There have been cases in world history when small tribes numbering a few hundred people have lived for centuries and even millennia. However, to do this, you'd have to leave mega cities. Big towns only import food. They're heavily dependent on farm fields and crops. During some global catastrophe, no one would give food to the cities. Hunger would lead to complete chaos. To live well, people would need to escape from their towns and repeat the practice of those who lived in the early Neolithic period. It was about 12,000 years ago, just after the end of the last ice age. People at that time lived separately in small villages. The population of each of them was from a couple of hundred to a thousand people. They lived independently, provided food and made big families. In fact, it's not such a bad option after the apocalypse to grow vegetables on a small farm, eat healthy food, and enjoy nature. In 2018, the most powerful underwater earthquake occurred between East Africa and Madagascar. There was a deep rift between the Earth's crust and the mantle. Hundreds of thousands of tons of magma came out on the surface of the ocean floor. After that, a huge underwater volcano with a height of 2,700 feet was formed near the coast of Madagascar. This is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. And all this is hidden under the water. French scientists studied this place since it had regular seismic activity. When the geologists went on an expedition to the coast of Madagascar, they discovered this giant underwater rock, which was not here until recently. With the help of geological equipment, they discovered the earthquake happened deeper than usual, below the Earth's crust. Geologists created a special observatory to monitor the situation at this site in real time. Between February and May 2019, they recorded about 17,000 seismic activities below the ocean floor. Scientists had never recorded such deep earthquakes. This suggests that there are reservoirs and drainage systems inside our planet through which magma flows. It's like the veins and vessels of a living organism. The volume of lava the volcano spews at this place can be compared with the volcanic eruptions in the hottest spots of Earth. Perhaps this is one of the most catastrophic, but at the same time, beautiful events in nature over the past few years. To understand what can be beautiful about this, let's first figure out what an underwater volcano is and how it works. Inside our planet, 
there are incandescent liquid metals and molten rocks containing almost all the chemical elements from the periodic table. All this hot substance is called magma, which constantly flows in the planet's bowels. Anyway, magma is lighter than the surrounding Earth's crust, so it always tries to break out upwards. Fortunately, the surface of our planet is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes it happens, and here's why. The Earth's crust consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other because of movement. Imagine a massive picture of puzzles. Each detail of this puzzle is a tectonic plate, and they all are constantly moving. Sometimes one puzzle gets unhooked from another. When this happens, magma immediately spills out of the resulting gap. And these places of faults with flowing magma we call volcanoes. When such a volcano erupts, a new geology begins. A splash of magma shakes the ocean floor. Lava and ash erupt from the inside of our planet. It causes a release of destructive energy of incredible power. But thanks to the water, such a catastrophe can go unnoticed. More than 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. But inside the water, there's a total mess. Lava heats the water and destroys the seabed. The ocean in this area boils, and large air bubbles rise up. But the enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's destructive power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed. The ocean blocks the consequences of the disaster. But sometimes, the eruption gets to the surface. Such a case occurred in 2012. Vast pieces of pumice the size of a van began to float up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were hundreds, even thousands of them. It was more like a group of unknown islands. Volcanic rocks scattered in the ocean over an area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists used deep-sea sonar apparatus on the remote control to determine the full scale of the disaster. They studied the seabed for a long time and found 14 craters that released lava. The researchers saw that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and scattered throughout the ocean. The rest was scattered along the bottom. It destroyed all marine life in the area. However, after the eruption of volcanoes, life is reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Volcanic ash, lava, and soil around the volcano contain many useful elements and minerals. They nourish the soil and promote the development of microorganisms not only on land but also in water. That's why there's so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form natural islands. This is a long process, resulting from which a large piece of land comes out of the water. When magma goes out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. The eruption can go on for a long time. The release magma raises the level of the seabed. After another hundred, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows lay a new layer on the surface of the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano has been growing. It's slowly rising up because of constant eruptions. Some volcanoes may go out forever, and some continue to erupt. And then, one day, the level of volcanic rock reaches the surface in the form of a huge island. After many more years, the volcano may go out, and then life appears on the formed island. The destroyed seabed area is filled with animals, trees, flowers, and plants. These volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth was born. There are hundreds of islands around the world that have appeared because of eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people. They build villages and small towns there. The ground on such islands is fertile. Fruits and vegetables grow there. The water is filled with fish. Such places may seem like paradise, but at the same time, it's dangerous to live there because the volcano may wake up. One of the most famous eruptions occurred on the island of Ogashima, south of Tokyo. 
people built a beautiful city right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, the eruption began. No one expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose and flew away from the island. And then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from beneath the underground depths. Thick smoke escaped from the top of the green volcano. The mountain threw dirt, large rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People managed to evacuate. And then there was a long recovery. Locals rebuilt the houses and brought the city back. Almost 250 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano has never woken up. Despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue to live there. The population is growing since this place resembles paradise, and no one wants to leave it. There are thermal springs, dense jungles with rich soil, and many fish. Meteorological and seismological services constantly monitor the volcano's activity. Movements and fractures of tectonic plates create another natural disaster, destructive tsunamis. Unlike volcanoes, Huge waves are formed when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically, up or down. When this happens, water pressure shifts on the ocean floor, which releases energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you form a small wave when you throw a stone into the water. First, a small tsunami appears. Then it picks up speed and increases in size. Its height can reach the level of a five-story building. It's heading for the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is almost twice as fast as a Formula One race car. Millions of gallons of water, weighing thousands of tons, are getting closer. And now, the wave reaches the shore and demolishes everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. Such tsunamis are a frequent occurrence on the coast of Japan. People have built massive shields near the land to stop the waves before they hit the shore. Still, in spite of all preparedness, somehow, nature always prevails. If all the volcanoes on Earth suddenly erupted together, it'd be loud. <laughs> We'd also have around 1,500 of these formations bursting at once. Now, normally, it's just 10 to 20 volcanoes that are active each day. But what would the world look like if they all blew their tops simultaneously? Geologists think it wouldn't be pretty. Even if only the land volcanoes erupted together, it would set off a chain reaction way worse than anything we've ever seen before. The two big problems would be ash and volcanic gases. While the explosions in lava would be damaging for people nearby, the real danger lies in what happens next. A thick layer of ash would cover the planet blocking out sunlight completely. No sunlight means no photosynthesis, which means crops would fade away and temperatures would drop considerably. And all this ash cloud could remain in our atmosphere for up to 10 years. Now, ash aside, there's also acid rain to worry about. Volcanic gases like hydrochloric acid and sulfur dioxide would mix with the atmosphere and fall back down as acid rain. This type of weather would harm the groundwater and ocean surfaces. Even if humans would find a way to survive up to this point, we'd have no corals and no other sea creatures around. Scientists have seen similar events in Earth's history at a smaller scale. Big volcanic eruptions have been linked to mass extinctions. When Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it cooled parts of the world for two years. But the extra carbon dioxide from these eruptions could also heat the planet the same way we turn our stoves to broil for that extra crispy layer on our casserole. Mm. Geologists also mention that there's evidence in our atmosphere that stuff like this may have happened in the distant past. During the Cretaceous period, carbon dioxide levels were way higher than today, which made it difficult for marine life to thrive. Who would survive all this? Probably just some extremophiles. These organisms that survive in harsh conditions like hot springs or deep undersea vents. As for humans, we could all lay low in underground bunkers until things clear up. Or build multiple space stations that could fit us all. Yeah, right. 
The chances of all volcanoes erupting at once, though, are very slim. Whew. That's because there isn't one giant source supplying all the volcanoes on Earth. Each one of these openings has its own deposit of magma, except for a few cases where they indeed share the supply. For example, in 1912, Nova Rupta in Alaska erupted alongside another volcano, sharing magma. Scientists have also found evidence of magma hiding under volcanic areas, like under the Taupau Volcanic Zone in New Zealand. This magma can spread out horizontally for long distances, but it's still just a local feature. Even if we consider all the magma under Taupau as one system, it's not connected to other volcanic areas like Indonesia or the Philippines. Because the great majority are isolated, volcanoes can't sink up to erupt at once. The magma comes from different processes, like mantle decompression or adding water to the mantle through subduction. There's no way to make all these different volcanoes erupt together because of how tectonics work. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see interesting volcano activity in the future. Take an underwater area near British Columbia, where recently about 200 small earthquakes per hour have been noted. Deep beneath the Pacific Ocean floor, off the coast of Vancouver Island, magma is set to erupt, heating the water so much that it'll bubble like soda. However, this event will likely go unnoticed by anyone other than scientists. The anticipated eruption will most likely happen around 3 miles below the ocean surface. Scientists explain that the earthquakes range from negative to 4.1 magnitude, meaning only those nearby would feel any tremors. This unusual activity gives us a rare opportunity to study how the Earth's crust forms. The magma beneath the ocean floor is estimated to be almost 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but will cool rapidly upon eruption and contact with water. This runny rock will solidify upon contact with the seafloor, turning black quickly. This event will be useful for biologists, too, who will have the opportunity to study the marine animal's response to any changes, like run! Antarctica, often seen as a vast icy continent, also holds a volcanic surprise beneath its frozen surface. Researchers have identified over 130 under the western ice sheet alone, making it the largest volcanic region on Earth. Most of these volcanoes, about 90, were only recently discovered in 2017. But could any of these Antarctic volcanoes actually erupt? Well, it depends on which volcano we're talking about. While these formations are relatively young in geologic terms, it's hard for scientists to tell if they're still active or not. There are only two confirmed active volcanoes in Antarctica, Deception Island and Mount Erebus. The latter, standing tall as the highest peak on the continent, has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It's known for emitting gas and steam, and sometimes even throwing out rocks in what are called Strombolian eruptions. One of its most notable features is a persistent lava lake in its crater, a rare phenomenon due to specific conditions needed to keep the surface molten. For instance, it's fueled by a steady supply of magma from deep within the Earth's mantle. This continuous inflow of molten rock provides the material for the lava lake to exist. It also features low ambient temperatures. Despite its location in Antarctica, Erebus has relatively mild temperatures in its summit region because of the heat generated by the volcanic activity. This allows the lava lake to remain liquid rather than freezing over. Deception Island, another active volcano, last erupted in the 70s. While it's currently not showing signs of imminent eruption, it's being monitored closely for any concerning activity. Apart from these two being confirmed to be active, Antarctica is dotted with fumaroles, openings in the Earth's crust that release gases and vapors. Sometimes these fumaroles can create icy towers reaching heights of 10 feet. What we should focus on is maybe supervolcanoes. They're this type that has the potential to produce the most massive and destructive eruptions. Unlike the typical one, which has a single vent, supervolcanoes have a vast magma chamber beneath the surface, spanning tens or even hundreds of miles in diameter. Their eruptions can have catastrophic effects on the surrounding area and even impact global climate patterns because of the amounts of ash and gases they spill out into the atmosphere. One famous supervolcano is the Yellowstone one which some say is gearing up for another eruption. 
It has the capacity to unleash a colossal eruption, spewing over 240 cubic miles of material. As much as we'd like to predict its behavior, volcanoes don't stick to a calendar. Hmm. On the contrary, eruptions simply happen when there's enough magma beneath the surface. There also needs to be enough pressure for the magma to travel upwards. As far as we can measure, these conditions are not currently met at Yellowstone. Sure, many volcanoes operate on a cyclical pattern, but that doesn't mean Yellowstone is overdue. In fact, Yellowstone has had just three major eruptions over the past 2.1 million years. Also, the term supervolcano refers to the formation size, not necessarily how fussy it is. Yellowstone's monitoring is extensive, tracking seismicity, ground deformation, thermal emissions, gas, water chemistry, and surface changes. Signs of an eruption would include thousands of earthquakes over a short period. We'd also see deformation on the ground and weird gas emissions ahead of time. Stable as it might look like for now, the consequences of it having a major eruption could look ugly. Ash dispersion could blanket a 500-mile radius, potentially disrupting Midwest agriculture and clogging waterways. Ash and gas emissions into the stratosphere could induce global climactic effects, making our planet colder for several years. And yes, we've seen some research that it shows there's more liquid molten rock under the Yellowstone volcano than scientists believe. But that doesn't translate to imminent danger. Imagine standing in the middle of Europe 40,000 years ago. The landscape is rough, cold, and unforgiving. Fast food is scarce, and there's no internet. Suddenly, from out of the woods steps a figure, stocky, strong, and with a face that is quite unusual. This human looks similar to us, but something about them is different. Their brow is heavy, their nose is broad, and their body seems to be built to fight nature itself. Well, congrats! You've just met a Neanderthal. You might have thought that Neanderthals were basically ancient humans, but that's not really true. We come from the same genus called Homo, but we, all modern humans, belong to one same species called Homo sapiens. However, there used to be lots of human species before, and Homo neanderthalensis was just one of them. And they actually were kind of cooler than us. So what in the world has happened to them? Neanderthals lived for a long time, for about 360,000 years, across Europe and parts of Asia. 40,000 years ago, the place we now call Southern Italy was sitting on top of a huge disaster, a massive supervolcano called Campi Flegre. This big boy is huge, about 9 miles wide. That's about 10 to 20 minutes in a car to get across it all. But there were no cars then, remember? At the time, it was quiet for a while. But one day, suddenly, it blew in what became one of the biggest volcanic eruptions Europe had seen in 200,000 years. The catastrophe was so crazy that ash, gases, and debris altered the climate across the entire continent. What comes next is usually called a volcanic winter. Average temperatures drop, the sky gets darker, and life becomes even harsher than it already is. The eruption, known as the Campanian Ingambrite, caused Europe to cool by as much as 7 degrees Fahrenheit. Doesn't sound like much? Well, the drop of even 1 degree would cause winters to become harsher, causing horrible snowfall, rains, and floods. Crops would struggle to grow, leading to food shortages. The weather would go wild, too, with storms and droughts. Hey, kind of like now. Except multiply this by 7. Events like these caused some huge chaos in modern times. You can imagine what it did to the Neanderthals. But in reality, a simple volcanic eruption shouldn't destroy an entire species, right? Well, yes. The truth is, the Neanderthals were already hanging by a thread back then. And all because of us. They've been in a tough spot for a while. They lived in places that are now parts of Europe, Western Asia, and the Middle East. Modern humans, us Homo sapiens, entered Europe and were giving them some serious competition for food and shelter. Homo sapiens were sneaky dudes, better at finding food, easily adapting to different environments, and using more advanced tools. We were pushing Neanderthals out, trying to get the same resources. We literally made their extinction a slow and very unpleasant process. 
So while the volcano definitely made things worse, it wasn't their only problem, and they didn't completely disappear after the eruption. Some of them hung on in isolated places, like Gibraltar, for another 12,000 years. That's because it's likely most of the severe cooling actually happened farther east, away from where the Neanderthals were trying to survive, and it didn't hit their homes as hard as we thought. In fact, the eruption may have even helped them, at least for a while. Some scientists say that the volcanic fallout might have slowed down modern humans' expansion into Neanderthal territory and gave the poor fellas a little more time to survive. So, the Campi Flegre eruption was a nasty event, but it only delayed the inevitable. Campi Flegre is a wild card. It's also known as the Fields of Fire. The air itself there is thick with legend. The Greeks and Romans believed this volcano was the gateway to the underworld. Even an ancient Roman poet, Virgil, hey Virgil, mentioned this in his famous story The Aeneid. The hero Aeneas must descend into the underworld, and this place is exactly where he starts. Back in the day, this landscape was full of Roman villas, spas, and fish ponds. The elite had the time of their lives there. What they didn't know, though, was that they were standing on treacherous ground that could go crazy at any moment. The Campi Flegre is not your typical volcano. You'd imagine a single towering peak, but the landscape looks deceivingly calm, with small features popping up here and there. But if you flew above it, the sight would be insane. A gigantic circular basin, peppered with volcanic cones and craters, like scars from the Earth's violent past. The danger here lies in its subtlety. The ground beneath your feet is constantly shifting, even when you don't notice it. Every so often, the land rises, only to sink again, sometimes by several feet, as magma or gas moves beneath the surface. It's incredibly creepy. The risk is almost invisible. The Campi Flegre is a massive depression formed by two colossal volcanic eruptions. One of them was the one that cooked Neanderthals, and another happened 15,000 years ago. The most famous eruption, though, happened in the 16th century, and it was horrifying. The year was 1538. For years, the people of Pazuali had noticed something unsettling. Land that once sat below the waves was slowly rising. What was once the sea had become new ground. Rumblings from deep within the earth were terrifying, but had become a normal part of life. Earthquakes started in the early 1530s, small at first, but in just eight years, they became the norm. Until one day, on September 28th, horrifying tremors shook the ground. By the next evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, a massive crack ripped open the earth near the ancient Roman town of Tripergoli. From this gash spewed fire, smoke, and a rain of volcanic ash miles away. It was thick and muddy, likely mixed with underground water. The ground trembled as hot pumice rock was thrown high into the air. And then a new mountain began to rise from the land. This was the birth of what we now call Monte Nuovo. Eventually, things seemed to calm down, as if the Earth was catching its breath. For days, things seemed quiet. Locals relaxed a bit. They began to approach the new mysterious volcano, a crater with something that resembled boiling within it. People visited it like a new attraction. But then, just days later, the disaster struck again. At night, without warning, a new mountain went wild. A blast from the southern flank hurled scoria, chunks of jagged volcanic rock, into the air. This one was fatal for 24 people. The debris found afterwards was huge and coarse. For centuries after, the only signs of life from the Monte Nuovo were small fumaroles, jets of gas seeping from the earth. But then, even those faded away. Now it's just a lush green cone, a pretty sleeping giant. But the ground near Naples, Italy, is still alive. The Campi Flegre sits quietly for now, but it might not be for long. It's showing signs it might be waking up again. This supervolcano looks like a hellish landscape, with its boiling mud pits, geysers, and steam vents. Romans and medieval Christians once believed it was a gateway to the underworld. And who can blame them? What's spooky is that recently scientists detected unusual activity under the surface. In 2012, 
Italian authorities raised the alert level on the volcano from green to yellow, meaning that it needs close monitoring. There are certain changes that usually happen before an eruption. The magma below starts releasing gases, which could weaken the rock above, eventually triggering a disaster. Unfortunately, no one can predict exactly when or if it will erupt. But if it does, the consequences could range from a minor inconvenience for locals to a global catastrophe. Its last tiny eruption happened in the 16th century, and it wasn't too bad. But if history repeats itself, like it was with Neanderthals, we're all cooked. An eruption like that could lead to global cooling, crop failures, and widespread famine. Right now, a group of scientists is trying to get a clearer picture of what's happening beneath the surface. The Copy Flegre Deep Drilling Project is working to drill a 10,000-foot borehole, hoping to check out the magma chamber up close. But at least for now, the supervolcano remains quiet. And let's hope it stays that way. Wow! Earth's surface is shaking! Long cracks split the ground open. Lava rivers are rapidly flowing down the slopes. Deafening noise is filling the air. Rocks and other debris are flying high up. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash cover the sky. Now this is not a plot of a blockbuster disaster movie. It's what happens when super volcanoes decide to erupt. But this is likely not the scenario that will take place when the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, decides to finish its long, long nap. In 2021, scientists were sure it would happen soon. But so far, nothing. The volcano's seismicity keeps increasing and then going back to normal. But you never know when this giant will finally come back to life. That's why experts have been monitoring geological activity on Hawaii's largest island for quite some time. The Big Island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, including the most active on the planet, Kilauea, and the largest, Mauna Loa. This gigantic thing makes up almost half the landmass of the island. And what lava Kilauea emits in one day, Mauna Loa could spew out within 20 minutes. That's what it did in 1984. While Mauna Loa's smaller sibling has been throwing tantrums for a while, the giant has been slumbering ever since its last eruption. But very recently, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has recorded more than 200 mini earthquakes below Mauna Loa. It likely means an increased flow of magma down there. Good morning! The volcano might be waking up, or not. If Mauna Loa did suddenly erupt, lava flows could reach the ocean and the most populated and touristy places, like Captain Cook, very, very quickly, in a matter of hours. In 1984, the last time the volcano erupted, lava got as far as the outskirts of Hilo on the other side of the island. That's where a campus of the University of Hawaii is found. Luckily, people had a few weeks' warning to get ready for the disaster. These days, locals have special go-bags ready with the most important stuff, including documents and money. Such precautions can come in handy in case of an emergency evacuation. Even though most Mauna Loa eruptions have so far only affected the summit area, several of them sent lava all the way down to the ocean. And you never know how powerful the next eruption will be. Now, what is the highest mountain on Earth? Mount Everest, you say? Well, it depends. From seafloor to the summit, Mauna Loa is a thousand feet taller than the famous Himalayan peak. The volcano is so big, it makes the Pacific plate it's sitting on literally slump under its weight. Scientists say that when this monster of a volcano erupts, the volume of lava coming out per unit will be life-threatening. Over its recorded history, Mauna Loa has been erupting regularly, almost every six years. And even though the last eruption of the volcano occurred about 40 years ago, scientists are certain it'll happen again. Now, remember the scene I showed you at the beginning? Well, you can relax. It's not likely to happen with Mauna Loa. The thing is, big island volcanoes, including Mauna Loa, aren't very volatile. That's because they're shield volcanoes. These volcanoes got such a name because they aren't really very high and resemble a warrior's shield placed flat on the ground. Shield volcanoes get formed by very fluid lava. It travels farther and forms much thinner flows than lava erupted from a stratovolcano, which is conically shaped and tall, like the infamous Krakatoa in Indonesia. 
So if, or should I say when, Mauna Loa erupts, there probably won't be ash clouds and tons of debris. The most dangerous thing will be lava. Since Mauna Loa is a shield volcano, its lava is extremely fluid and voluminous, which allows it to flow far and fast. Using theoretical vent maps, experts from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory have made charts of possible lava flows. They're kind of worried about earthquakes clustering at high rates. It likely means that lava is on the move under the surface. 500 to 600 earthquakes per day are a serious reason to be on high alert. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean a disaster or inevitable eruption. Around a decade ago, several earthquakes that happened at the same time signaled that something was happening under Mauna Loa. But an eruption didn't occur. Instead, half the volcano shifted a bit to the south. This way, it probably gave more room to magma so that it had enough space to stay beneath the surface. Now, let's get back to the catastrophic eruption we saw at the beginning of the video. That's what often happens when a supervolcano erupts. Those are volcanoes that have at least once had an eruption with a volcanic explosivity index of 8, which is the largest recorded number on the index. Supervolcanoes are often extremely large, with no cone at all. That's because they're typically the remains of gigantic magma chambers that once flared up, leaving behind a caldera. They're usually found over hot spots. Supervolcanoes can produce super eruptions, and when they do, they blow more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes get formed when gigantic volumes of scorching hot magma are trying to escape from deep underground. This magma rises close to the surface but can't break through Earth's crust. That's why a huge pressurized pool of bubbling magma gathers at a depth of only several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more magma is trying to get to the surface. Until, bam, a super eruption occurs. The most recent super eruption happened in New Zealand. Well, when I say recent, I mean around 26,500 years ago. Nah, I wasn't around then. That's when a supervolcano beneath the surface of Lake Taubo spewed into the air more than 300 cubic miles of ash and pumice. Imagine 500,000 great pyramids of Giza flying up at the same time. That's how incredibly powerful that eruption was. But the most exciting and confusing thing about the eruption was that the Taubo volcano simply didn't go off like many others. At first, everything was going as usual. More than 200 square miles of magma had built up under the surface, and the pressure was getting higher and higher. But after the rock cracked and the first part of lava rushed out of the crater, something went wrong, and the supervolcano took a break. Only several months later, the disastrous eruption shook the ground, and thousands of tons of lava, rocks, and ash flew high into the atmosphere. But the age of supervolcanoes isn't over. The most infamous of them all is probably the one in Yellowstone National Park. This giant handles at least three mega-powerful eruptions, and who knows how many smaller ones. If this monster erupted anywhere as strongly as it did 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of red-hot material. You can probably picture it more vividly if I tell you that this volume is comparable to 65 million capital rotundas in Washington, D.C. piled together. Wow. Anyway, scientists are sure that Yellowstone doesn't present any danger these days. For an eruption to happen, magma inside must be at least 50% molten. With the Yellowstone caldera, this number is just 5 to 15%. But of course, Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on our planet. There's also New Zealand's Tabo you already know about, Japan's Arikaldra, California's Long Valley, Indonesia's Toba, any of them can one day produce a super eruption. There are also several so-called supervolcanoes that haven't lived up to this name yet because they've never produced anything like a super eruption. For example, in 1883, Indonesian volcano Krakatoa went off. The power of the eruption tore the volcano's walls open, and cold seawater rushed into its molten insides. The difference in temperature made the volcano blow up with a deafening boom. 
it was clearly heard 2,000 miles away in Australia. It earned the blast the title of the loudest sound in history. But even though the consequences of this event were truly catastrophic, it still turned out not powerful enough to be called a super eruption. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind – the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week. And it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events they can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March. But the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. 
The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. Phew! You can finally send that last report for the day and breathe out. The weekend is around the corner, but just when you're about to hit send, you're alarmed by the low rumbling under your desk. Is it the light rail passing by? Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's a volcano speaking. What? Here? In Arizona? That's right, the ground keeps shifting under Arizona, reminding us that Earth is alive. No panic, though. Let's arm ourselves with some context. 20 American states have extinct, active, and dormant, currently sleeping, volcanoes. Among such states, you can find California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. On the bright side, 
Arizona's volcanoes are dormant at the moment, but it doesn't mean they won't go off in the near or not so near future. Now, how about traveling to Arizona to check the traces of its active volcanic past? They dot the desert landscapes of this state like spots dot a Dalmatian. There are entire volcanic fields southwest of Phoenix, east of Douglas, near Flagstaff, north of Kingman, and near the Mexico border. The most worrying thing about these fields is that even though they're not active at the moment, eruptions in this region might happen every thousand years or so. Well, the time seems to be up. The last powerful and destructive volcanic eruption occurred around 1,000 years ago at the Sunset Crater. Oh, this place is worth paying more attention to. And we will, but a bit later. First, we have to talk about hotspots. No, not that place where you can surf the web. In our volcanic context, a hotspot is a place where insane amounts of heat melt the overlying crust, Earth's thin outer layer, and form volcanoes. This heat rises from the mantle, which is located between our planet's dense, superheated core and the crust. Want to see an example of this type of volcanism? Welcome to the Hawaiian Islands. The Big Island has its active volcanoes because, at the moment, it's situated on top of the Hawaiian hotspot. The older Hawaiian Islands were once there too, but later they drifted off towards the northwest. It happened because that's where the oceanic crust on top of which they sat, namely the Pacific Plate, moved. Now, look at the world's ocean basins. Yes, they're literally dotted with islands that sit on top of hotspots, like Hawaii. Iceland, Samoa, the Galapagos, those are probably the most famous examples. But don't think that continents can't host hotspots, they can, but those are far less common. One of the most famous continental hotspots is, ah, I bet you know it, yep, the one beneath the Yellowstone caldera. By the way, the caldera is a vast volcanic crater especially one formed as a result of a massive eruption that led to the collapse of the mouth of a volcano. The Yellowstone hotspot is basically the creator of Old Faithful and the rest of the hot springs and mud pots for which the national park is famous. Speaking of Old Faithful, let's make a small detour and pay more attention to this wonder of nature. It's one of the most well-known geysers in the world. People have been coming from all over the globe to see it for more than a century. The cool thing about this geyser is that the likes of it can only form under very specific conditions. That's why they're pretty rare. Magma under the surface superheats pockets of underground water. The pressure there keeps growing until it eventually pushes the water upward with immense strength. A certain volcanic rock with a high silica content lines the tunnel through which this water escapes. Basically, it creates a unique pipe that can withstand unbelievable pressure and heat created by the water erupting above the ground. Old Faithful was the very first named geyser in Yellowstone. If you come to visit it expecting the thing to erupt every hour on the hour, you're gonna be disappointed. On average, Old Faithful erupts every 91 minutes or so, which isn't that bad either. Plus, you can download a special app which will provide you with the approximate time of the next eruption. But be very careful while visiting and stay away from the site. The water erupting from the powerful geyser reaches 204 degrees Fahrenheit. The steam is even more scorching, up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot enough to bake a cake. But let's get back to our volcanic hotspots. Scientists still don't clearly understand why there aren't many hotspot volcanoes on continental crust. One reason might be that the continental crust is much thicker than the oceanic crust, which is about four times as thick on average. Another reason could be that most of Earth's crust, about two-thirds of it, is oceanic. This means that there's less continental crust for hotspots to form under. Now, I bet those of you living in Arizona will appreciate the following info. We'll talk about a volcanic field right in the heart of this state, the San Francisco Volcanic Field. 
That's a massive area filled with over 600 volcanoes. Yes, they're mostly small, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. They're scattered across 1,800 square miles in northern Arizona, a giant territory. Interestingly, scientists are still debating about whether this volcanic field is actually sitting on top of a hotspot. But one thing they agree upon, the volcanoes in this area get younger as you move east. And this pattern matches up with the North American plate moving west over what could be a stationary hotspot beneath the surface of our planet. Cool, huh? The volcanic hullabaloo in that area started around 6 million years ago. So, in geological terms, it's relatively young. As for the most recent eruption, it happened less than a thousand years ago. The Sunset Crater, which I mentioned before, the one near Flagstaff, is the most famous vent from that eruption. The Sinagua people had to leave their homes at Wupatki Pueblo because of the eruption. That site is now part of the Wupatki National Monument. There, you can see how people lived in this volcanic region many years ago. If you go to explore this area, you'll notice that most of the volcanoes there are basalt cinder cones, small and steep. The Colorado Plateau has quite dry weather conditions. That's why the volcanoes haven't worn down much. Some of the best examples of those cones, like this one, called the SP Crater, still look like they appeared yesterday. But look around. It's not just cinder cones. The San Francisco volcanic field also has a stratovolcano, as well as some lava domes that formed from volcanic rocks with more silica than basalt you can find in places like Hawaii. It means they're thicker and don't flow as easily. Anyway, the stratovolcano is going to be one of the most epic sites you'll come across while exploring this volcanic field. Well, not the stratovolcano itself, but the San Francisco peaks, the remains of that giant formation. They stand tall at more than 12,600 feet. That's four and a half Burj Khalifas placed on top of one another. It makes the peaks some of the biggest landmarks in northern Arizona. They're not only stunning, but also sacred to the Native American people who have lived in the area for many generations. Now, unlike those super active volcanoes in Hawaii, the San Francisco volcanic field takes its time, thousands of years between eruptions. But you shouldn't relax just yet. Geologists say another eruption is likely to happen one day. It will probably occur in the remote eastern part of the field, away from big towns. Phew! And if that next eruption is anything like the one that formed Sunset Crater, it would be quite the show. Lava fountains and rivers of lava flowing. At the same time, the next eruption might not happen for centuries, maybe even millennia. Until then, the San Francisco volcanic field will remain a hidden gem of volcanic history, waiting for its next fiery performance. The latest super eruption of Yellowstone occurred 640,000 years ago, and it was long before Homo sapiens saw the light of day. But we were around during another, no less devastating natural disaster. This super eruption took place on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago. That's when an erupting supervolcano wreaked havoc on huge territories sending up plumes of debris and ash that spread for thousands of miles and caused temperatures on the planet to plummet. The effects of this super eruption were visible as far away as southern Africa. Experts believe they could have impacted early humans there. By the time the volcano erupted, our ancestors had already been using stone tools and had likely known how to produce yarn. And some specialists even think that the Toba super eruption was so powerful it could push our ancestors to the brink of extinction. They claim that Toba might be the largest volcanic eruption to occur on Earth within the last two million years. The eruption disgorged so much pyroclastic rock it would be enough to cover the entire United States to the depth of a one-story house. About a third of that deposit piled up on northern Sumatra while a lot more ended up beneath the floor of the Indian Ocean. The super eruption left an elliptical crater lake around 60 miles long. 
The caldera is so large, it's hard to feel that you're indeed in a volcano. Pumice deposits from the eruption remain in the canyon walls and go deep below the ground. There aren't many arguments about the amount of pumice and ash involved in this disaster. At the same time, experts aren't sure how much sulfur ended up in the atmosphere. Even some sulfur layers in the polar ice could be potential candidates. But so far, scientists haven't found any connection between them and Toba. But let's get back to the dramatic impact the super eruption had on early humans. It turns out some not only survived, but even thrived after this natural catastrophe, at least judging by the artifacts they made during and after the eruption. The disaster might not have posed a serious threat to those of our ancestors who took refuge along the coast. Genetic evidence hints that modern humans descend from a few thousand people that ventured out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. Why just a few thousand? According to some experts, the rest of our ancestors could have been devastated by the Toba eruption. After all, the supervolcano spewed out a thousand cubic miles of dust and rock in a flash, leaving a scar in the ground that was dozens of miles wide. All that dust and sulfur Toba sent into the atmosphere potentially cooled the surface of our planet, which led to the appearance of glaciers and the lowering of Earth's sea levels. And since Toba might have had an important role in shaping humankind, scientists have been working hard trying to understand precisely how early humans reacted to this disaster. In 2011, several researchers found an enigmatic soil sample in South Africa's Pinnacle Point, an archaeological site overlooking the Indian Ocean. This sample contained some volcanic ash, after examining the layer, they found more than 400,000 artifacts left by early humans. Those ranged from heat-treated stone tools to signs of fire and animal bones. Based on this finding, the team suggested that early humans on the South African coast thrived after the eruption, living in that area for thousands of years and improving their tools. The region might have served as a refuge during and after the Toba eruption, a 2009 study suggested that the eruption could have lowered global temperatures by 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have made survival tough elsewhere in Africa. If there had been a volcanic winter, it wouldn't have been as cold along the coastline. On the other hand, newer studies claim that Toba spewed out so much sulfur into the atmosphere that the resulting aerosols could have stuck together, which would have limited their cooling effect in the long term. In other words, right after the eruption, temperatures would have plummeted, but only in some regions. And after three years or so, the effects of the eruptions would have calmed down altogether, becoming not dangerous to humans. Well, apparently, more research is needed. Meanwhile, let's figure out if we should watch out for any volcanoes these days. Last year, thousands of small earthquakes shook the ground near Iceland's Svartsengi geothermal power plant. Magma rose to the surface there, and now it has opened wide fractures slicing through the small town of Grindavik. The ground there is still swelling, and an eruption might happen with little notice. But of course, that's not all. Over the planet, 45 other volcanoes keep rumbling. For example, Italy's Vesuvius, that infamous thing that finished the city of Pompeii in 79 CE. Over the last 17,000 years, the volcano has experienced eight explosive eruptions, followed by powerful pyroclastic flows. Dense masses of super-hot ash, lava fragments, and gases flowing at high speeds. The volcano's last eruption happened in 1944. Mount Rainier is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the USA. Its high elevation, chemical composition, and proximity to Washington, Seattle, and Tacoma suburbs and the volcano's ability to produce massive pyroclastic flows make Mount Rainier a threat to consider. The heat from this volcano could potentially melt the ice and snow covering it, leading to rapid downstream flows of debris, mud, and rocks. The Novorupta volcano in Alaska's Katmai National Park and Reserve formed in a 1912 eruption, which was the world's largest in the 20th century. The volcano sent almost 7 cubic miles of ash and debris into the air. 
It also produced such a powerful ash flow that it created the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Mount Pinatubo is located in a populated region in the Philippines. It became notorious after a 1991 massive eruption, which was the second largest eruption of the 20th century. More than 700 people lost their lives during that natural disaster. Today, more than 21 million people live within 62 miles of Pinatubo. Mount Agun, a continuously erupting volcano in Indonesia, had its last major eruption in 1963. It was one of the most tragic eruptions in the country's history. It lasted for 11 months, producing ashfall and pyroclastic flows that led to the loss of more than 1,000 lives and serious property damage. People saw ash plumes above the volcano throughout 2018, following the eruption in November 2017. Japan's Mount Fuji hasn't erupted since 1707. That year, a massive earthquake likely set it off. In 2014, experts warned that Fuji could be at risk of another eruption following the nine-magnitude earthquake that shook Japan in 2011. Experts believed the earthquake had raised pressure below Fuji. The eruption in 1707 sent so much ash and debris into the air that all this mass even reached Tokyo. Should Fuji erupt again, it would affect more than 25 million people in the surrounding areas. The eruption of Washington's Mount St. Helen in 1980 was one of the most destructive volcanic events in U.S. history. 57 people, as well as thousands of animals, lost their lives during that natural disaster. The eruption also destroyed around 200 square miles of forest. Experts think that Mount St. Helens' history of massive eruptions means that future catastrophes are bound to happen. The next explosive eruption might send large amounts of ash all over the Pacific Northwest. No wonder the volcano is under close monitoring. One of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, has been erupting for centuries. NASA claims that the biggest risk of this volcano is pyroclastic flows which can spread over vast areas and harm loads of people. For the last time, Merapi erupted in January 2024, sending plumes of smoke into the air. These days, more than 24 million people live in the area surrounding this volcano. So this huge volcano, everyone thought to be extinct, woke up and spat out a black ash cloud 50 miles high. That's about nine times as tall as Mount Everest. Located in what is now Indonesia, the powerful Krakatoa had caused huge tsunamis that rocked over ships as far away as South Africa. It also changed the temperatures around the world for several years. The volcanic island of Krakatoa in the Sunda Strait was likely born thanks to another major eruption several centuries ago. It hadn't erupted for at least 200 years before 1883. So the first tremors and blasts in May of that year came as a total shock to people living nearby. Then ships sailing through the busy water passage started reporting clouds of ash above the volcano. It went quiet again for a while, but they could still see ash above it. The eruption culminated at the end of August. It was so powerful that it shattered the island into fragments. Witnesses heard the sound produced by it in Australia, around 3,000 miles away. They described the noise as the roar of heavy cannons. Some say it was the loudest sound ever heard. During the next five days, the pressure wave from the eruption traveled around the globe three and a half times and was seen on barographs on different continents. Hot avalanches of ash spread down the volcano as far as 25 miles away at crazy speeds. They ruined the surrounding islands and took 36,000 lives. Tens of thousands more drowned in tsunamis that happened after the volcano had collapsed into the caldera. Over 100 coastal villages on Java and Sumatra were completely wiped out. All this made the waking up of Krakatoa one of the most devastating in the entire recorded history. The Earth's crust is like a giant puzzle made up of massive pieces known as tectonic plates. These plates are constantly sliding against each other over the mantle, which is the molten layer beneath. Indonesia is right in the middle of the so-called subduction zone. 
Here, the Indo-Australian plate collides with part of the Asian plate as it moves northward. As the oceanic plate dives down, it gets heated up, and you've got the perfect recipe for a volcanic hotspot. Krakatoa had three peaks, each serving as an exit door for a massive magma chamber beneath it. During a previous eruption, debris blocked one of these exits, and the pressure built up beneath. When Krakatoa finally blew its top, the blast split the magma chamber wide open. The eruption led to a so-called volcanic winter. Krakatoa had sent six cubic miles of rock, ash, and debris into the atmosphere. They created a thick veil that surrounded the Earth. The particles scattered sunlight, and the troposphere below cooled down. The effect stayed strong for several years. The northern hemisphere experienced colder-than-average temperatures, and in some regions, summer temperatures didn't rise to typical levels. Southern California received a record amount of rainfall in the months following the eruption. The sky became darker in different parts of the world for years afterwards. The sunsets, for many months, turned into a spectacular show of red and orange. One astronomer supposed it was the source of the inspiration for The Scream by Edvard Munch. The painting shows exactly what the sky over Norway looked like after the eruption. It also produced a rare type of halo called Bishop's Ring and a volcanic purple light at night. For several years after Krakatoa had blown up, the moon looked blue and sometimes green. That's because some ash clouds were full of particles large enough to scatter red light, only letting other colors pass. Someone even witnessed lavender sun and night-shining clouds. Krakatoa became the first scientifically well-recorded and studied eruption of a volcano. Between the moments the first clouds of ash were seen by a ship passing by and the disastrous eruption, scientists managed to organize geological expeditions. They studied the volcano and gathered samples of volcanic rocks. It became useful for understanding volcanic activity. Krakatoa was sleeping tight until the 1920s, when some locals noticed a column of steam and debris spewing from the collapsed caldera. Within weeks, the rim of a new cone sprang up above sea level. After a year, it was a small island named Child of Krakatoa. It continues to erupt, but fortunately, without serious consequences so far. In April of 1815, Mount Tambora unleashed a massive eruption, wreaking havoc on the Indonesian island of Sambawa. It destroyed homes and claimed 10,000 lives. Another 80,000 perished because of diseases that spread in the aftermath. The following went in history as the year without a summer. Cold, wet conditions wrapped Europe and North America in an unexpected chill. It became the coldest in at least 250 years. In the summer of that year, the temperatures dropped the most. Crops didn't grow, livestock didn't survive, and famine took over Western Europe and North America. New England had snow and terrible frost in the summer months. Food prices went up. Oats for horses became a luxury. Some people say it even inspired the invention of the bicycle in 1817. Scientists used early data and climate models to see if it was all because of the Tambora eruption. They compared the data to similar years. They showed that precipitation was around the same, but the temperatures were much warmer. When they introduced the volcano into the scenario, they got the exact data for the year without summer. They say that a powerful volcanic eruption like that one increases the likelihood of extreme cold by up to 100 times. The explosion of the Toba supervolcano on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago became the Earth's largest volcanic eruption in 28 million years. Parts of Indonesia, India, and a slice of the Indian Ocean got a cozy blanket made up of 6 inches of volcanic debris. It spat out a volume of rock comparable to almost 3 million Empire State Buildings. The crater it had left behind is still seen from space. All the ash and volcanic gases that sprang into the atmosphere because of the eruption partially blocked the sunlight. A severe volcanic winter began and lasted for 6 to 10 years. Some anthropologists see a connection between the Toba eruption and how limited modern humans are when it comes to genetic variety. 
around 74,000 years ago, exactly when the toba erupted, there was a population nosedive. That's why all modern humans trace their roots back to a tiny group of survivors. The toba catastrophe theory proposes that most early humans in Europe and Asia didn't make it through the post-eruption climate chaos. Instead, a lucky, genetically limited bunch found their safe haven in Africa. But archaeological and paleoclimate records disagree with this theory. Benjamin Black from Rutgers University and his team set out to crack the code and discovered a hidden paradox. Maybe we were peering through the wrong climate lens. They ran 42 different climate model simulations, varying the magnitude of volcanic emissions, time of year of the eruption, background climate state, and eruption column height to see what climate disruptions the Toba eruption might have caused. There was a significant drop in temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere in the first year after the event, up to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The Southern Hemisphere, where the early humans were settling, didn't go through a rough cooling that could have affected them all. The most significant eruptions that can seriously change the world's climatic patterns come from supervolcanoes, like Yellowstone or Mount Toba. Luckily, these erupt very rarely, about every 100,000 years or more. Still, climate scientists study volcanic eruptions to understand and explain short periods of cooling in the history of our planet. Every few decades or so, a volcanic eruption lets out a substantial number of particles and gases. Some of them will block enough sunlight to start a brief global cooling period. Nothing like the real volcanic winter, but still felt across the globe.